Herzlich willkommen zum On the Way to New Work Podcast. Ich sitze heute ohne Michael Trautmann hier. Wir sind auf der IO Unlimited. Das ist die Veranstaltung unseres Unternehmervereins, in dem wir beide sind, über die wir uns ja kennengelernt haben. Und es ist extrem spontan. Ich habe die Chance, unseren ersten Keynote-Speaker hier zu haben. And I will now switch to English. Um, our guest is Laura Decker. And you might have heard the name. You're like, I heard that name. But there's a very, very special story behind that name. And we had a very nice conversation before the podcast here. And um, I actually ran into you and said, hey, let's record a podcast. And you have your keynote. And you're like, what is this dude doing? So um, let's take some time to reveal who are you and um, how did you become the person who you are? <laughs> All right, well, well, it's a long story. Where do you want me to start? You, wherever you feel comfortable starting. Wherever I feel comfortable. Well, I guess I should start with, uh, with the biggest adventure of my life, um, sailing around the world at age 14 to 16. So yeah, that kind of made me the youngest person to ever do that. But it, I guess it's more about why I felt like I needed to do that or how I got there. So, yeah, yeah. It's not really one thing that got me there, really, actually. It's, it's um, I grew up on a boat. I was pretty much born on a boat, but not, yeah, almost. Um, during a circumnavigation of my parents, so my dad is a big sailor. He built his own boats and went sailing, met my mom. I was born halfway during a world voyage. Um, so it's, I really grew up with sailing and, and traveling and all that. So yeah, I think it, it was around seven or eight when I realized that one day that's what I wanted to do as well. Do that trip on your own? Was that well, early? not necessarily on my own. No, I didn't, I didn't think that far. No, it, it all, it, it would just went like, I want to sail around the world at some stage. <laughs> But I had no idea how or when or all the, all the details involved. I just knew I wanted to do it. So that's, I mean, you can put that in one sentence. I sailed around the world between 14 to 16, but there's, of course, much more to that, um, which I would love to like learn more about. But the story before that, when you like talk about your parents, you're originally from the Netherlands? Well, I, I find it a bit complicated. <laughs> my father is Dutch. My mom is German. I was born in New Zealand and I was about five or some four or five when we came back to Holland. Um, so that was the first time I'd ever really right. been there. And then of course I was, I was 14 when I left. So yes, a big part of my youth, I was in Holland, but at this stage, I've actually lived outside Holland much longer than inside. So I don't feel like, I don't really feel Dutch or feel like Holland is my home. I guess also partly because of all the things that happened and and the story before it. Um, but no, I, I don't really know generally when people ask where you're from, I, I say either New Zealand or just a world citizen. So what, how, did, how did your parents, like your father, you said, built his own boats. Like, what do your parents do? Like, how did that happen that you were like around the world, born around the world? I have an interesting family. Um, well, actually my grandparents are both pretty normal. But my dad decided he loved sailing when he was very little and he's, he's stubborn and likes traveling and just wants to do his own thing. So he started building boats when he was very young. Um, just, just little boats and he became bigger and bigger until I think he was 16 or 17 when he started Diario. So that was like a 12 meter seaworthy catch. Um, and my mom is kind of the same except for she doesn't like sailing really. But she left home when she was 16 or 17 and decided to just drive off in, her, in an old car and go to Southern Europe and ended up in some circus working, like cleaning out the horses. And, um, and then somehow she ended up in Holland being from Southern Germany and met my dad in the shipyard and decided, all right, let's go sail around the world, why not? Uh, without really having sailed much before or, or having any experience in that field. But they did sail around the world for seven years. Wow. And that's then the trip actually the where trip you were born. World, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's pretty good. And you said your mom actually didn't like sailing, but No, she doesn't really. So she loves the traveling and the living on the boat, but the the sailing not really. Um yes, she is uh she's a street performer, mm -hmm. so I guess that's kind of she did the circus and then just kept going in that. 
uh, everywhere they stopped along the world, they would just, yeah, she would do her street performing thing, mostly like clown shows, and sometimes she would perform with snakes, and just all sorts of magic tricks, and all sorts of stuff that she could think of, and my dad would find work fixing boats, or in shipyards, or, yeah. I have I have two kids and, and my wife is the sailor in our family so I, that's how I got to sailing. We have a folk boat and um, we went on a trip when my son was one and my daughter three and I was like that's too early and stuff can happen and then I realized because my wife feels super comfortable on the boat like there's not that experience you have but also super comfortable because she grew up with that and the kids could feel that energy yeah. and nothing happened like they felt comfortable they were not screaming everything was fine and that's when I realized okay there's something with this connection yeah. is that is that similar when you say I I was born on a boat I feel comfortable there and well it's what you say I, I think that's really important if the parents feel comfortable with the situation or they don't show that they're nervous or they they think it's not a good thing what are, what's happening then the kids are happy too. You know, as long as the parents are happy, the kids are happy. It doesn't really matter where you are or what's happening, I think, especially if they're very little. Um, in, in our case, it was a little bit different because my dad was super comfortable on the boat, but my mom wasn't. So when we were in a storm or something, then I would have probably felt that mom wasn't comfortable and dad was, um, which maybe also led to later on in life when um, when my parents were divorced and I had to make a decision who I was going to live with, I decided I was going to live with my dad. I was about six at that stage. So still fairly young, but yeah, that's what I felt comfortable with. I wanted to be on the water and around boats and yeah. Do you, if you, let's, let's move to that, clo coming closer to that trip. Um, when you said you felt you kind of wanted to go sailing, you want to go out, you want to discover. I mean, there's a process before you do that. You just yeah. don't decide, okay, let's go Well, like go, I said, or? around seven or eight, I decided that that's what I wanted to do at some stage in my life. And then it, and then it really slowly grew. So I did realize I was going to need a boat, and money, and learn a lot of stuff. And I, I just started with that. Like I started earning money wherever I could. And bought my first little seaworthy boat when I was 11 and sailed as much as I could. So I was like sailing every day in the winter in the snow and the hail and just going places and then sailed to England when I was 13. So I did really like full on practice even though I didn't have a timeline or anything like that. I just thought I'm going to go when I'm ready. And obviously everybody around me thought that's when you're like 20 or something. Um, but there came a stage when I sailed back from England, and I know it quite well, that I thought, well, I'm, I'm ready. Like, I felt like I was ready and that that was the right moment to do it. So yeah, that decision came pretty from one to the other day that I was going to leave now. Um, but that I wanted to do it and the run up to it, that was a lot of years, yeah. So um, this feeling ready, we talked we talked a little bit about it on, on the way here, like how important experience is in doing stuff you really love and like to do. Um, it sounds so easy when you like say it, but there is so much more for many people behind that, like yeah. who like drive to work and say, ah, someday I'm gonna go and travel. And I mean, nothing crazy, but like just take a car and travel somewhere, like your mom did, for example. Yeah. And. Um, from practicing, from experience, and that moment feeling ready, can you like describe a little bit what that did with you and, and, and how it came, how you Definitely. felt? Definitely. Although now I'm older, I do realize it's very different for being... The process is different for child versus adult. I think because a, a child, and that's a beautiful thing about children, they have something that adults have lost. And I think it's a curiosity and a, and a spark of life, like, like full on energy that adults are somehow lost in the kind of world of things going on. Um, so that's now if I would do something, I think it would be a little bit more difficult. But having the experience as a kid, it makes it for me a little bit easier because I know the reward. As a child, it was very, 
yeah, you think very simple. It is, and it is very simple, in fact. You know, you just go and prepare and do it. <laughs> it's not that difficult, but as an adult, you think, okay, well, there's this and this, and you have the experience that actually everything is just really tiring and that things don't work out, and, and you have to do it again. And as a child, you don't have this experience mm. yet. So you, you just do it, and it doesn't work, but you think, oh, well, I'm going to try it again. And that's exactly what I did. You know, you fail, and you fall on your nose, you do it again, and you practice again, and you capsize the boat again, and... Uh, you go the wrong way and I think as a child like that's the learning is really fun and it's an experiment and you're not tired of it yet whereas if you grow older you've all done it and you get tired of it you don't want to do it again and you already know what's going to happen and you're going to be wet and cold and you think you know what I'm going to just leave it at that <laughs> but that's that's the problem mm. we shouldn't do that because actually it is still fun and that's uh, I love working with children because that's kind of gives me the spark that sometimes I feel like I'm missing. You see the joy of life in their eyes. You see how everything is fun and beautiful and they're learning. And, and then I realize, yes, it is fun. And it, it, I do want to try it again and experiment it. And um, so, yeah, I think it's just a beautiful thing that I did get to do that as a child, that my dad gave me that freedom and allowed me to explore and experiment and go my own path mm. because often we are restricted in that. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I, I find it a difficult question because I think it really depends on which stage of life you're in and the further you get, I think the more difficult it is. But in the end, it's the same principle. You just don't, it's, it's so easy to keep making excuses. Mm. And this feeling of when I'm ready, I think it's really deep in your heart, you, are, you know it. And all the rest of it is just making excuses. So you just need to feel that and be honest to yourself um, to say whether it's like real concern or whether it's just an excuse to not do it for whatever reason. It's a, it, I, I love your answer, I have to say. <laughs> it's a difficult question <laughs> so because there it's, it's, not, it's not black and white, there's gray in between, there's purple, there's yeah. bright blue, there's a lot of colors in between and, and the noise of the excuses you can make with everything in life yeah. is just too loud so I, I love the answer and <laughs> and what what I find interesting is or what I, what I see is how difficult it can be to live in this this paradox of you need the security of your parents to know okay and I, I know I'm that's the right place and at the mm -hmm. same time you want to go out and play without looking back all the time yeah. to your parents and obviously your dad kind of and your mom together somehow they managed to like give you that yeah. spark to like yeah. feel safe and at the same time go and play yeah yeah they did and, and and yet again there isn't really a clear answer for that either because every child is different i mm. think the techniques my dad used for me wouldn't probably wouldn't have worked for my sister um but something i do love is that he never or i can't really remember many moments there were definitely moments that he he said i wasn't allowed to do something or i couldn't do it Whenever I came up with some stupid idea, <laughs> he would say, all right, you know, let's, let's sit down, let's talk about this. And he would say, well, what do, would you do if this happened? Or what would you do if that happened? And have you thought about the consequences of whatever you're planning to do? And through that, he kind of guided me to come to my, the, my own conclusion that maybe it wasn't such a good idea. Mm. <laughs> Instead of saying, no, you can't do that, or you're not allowed to do that. And then as a child, you would think, well, why not? You know, um, so I really love that, that he, he didn't really say that. He said, you can do it, but have you thought about it really? Because so <laughs> that's important. Do you remember that first conversation when you like revealed that idea and said, I'm going to do that? What do you... Yes, what, I do actually. What was it I, I think it was really a big surprise because he, you know, he saw me every day working on mm. it and planning out routes and looking at weather charts and stuff. So yes, when I did come to him, he said, okay, you know, let, let's sit down like he generally did and, and talk through the problems mm. as usual. And I said, you know, I've thought about it. And I really had thought about it. This wasn't like a crazy idea. So, and he came to realize that as well. Uh, and then said, well, if you can prepare everything yourself, you know, get the boat ready, find sponsors and convince people around you that it's a good idea, then, then I will let you go. And when I, I talked about this with him, maybe two, two or three years ago or something, and he said, well, for me, that was like part of your preparation. If you can show to me, 
you're capable of handling the organization of making such a voyage, like preparing everything, mm. then I know you can also handle that when you're out there somewhere because you also need to organize and prepare it. Um, so yeah, that was, a, that was a big part of it for him that I really did it myself. And if I showed I could handle it myself, he would stand behind me and help me where needed. What was the most difficult question he, he challenged? Oh, good question. I don't know, actually. It's a, it's a long time ago. For, I do know for him the biggest concern was being on land. Mm -hmm. He wasn't concerned about the sailing or storms or anything like that because he knew I could sail and could handle that. Um, so all questions regarding the boat or difficult situations on that uh, yeah, weren't difficult. But on land was definitely, you know, an issue like trusting me there. And uh, he, he did make a rule that I just wasn't allowed to go anywhere alone on land, which is kind of funny if you're sailing around the world alone. <laughs> <That's> so, <laughs> I, I, yeah. Kinda. So, he, yeah, he mm -hmm. just said, you know, always anchor with where there's other boats and go to them, make friends. Don't go shopping alone or exploring alone. Just go and make friends and go together with them on land. And that's what I did. So, yeah, that was actually good practice too, because I'm a, generally, I'm kind of, I'd rather do things alone and I was a mm. bit shy, but because he kind of forced me to not go anywhere alone, I did have to go over and make friends. <laughs> In the end, I'm really happy about that. So, through that. if you, if you could say that's your comfort zone, staying on your own, but the sailing is not like leaving the comfort zone. For many other people, that would be leaving the comfort zone. So right. for you, that's different. Yeah, yeah, for me, it was probably the other way around. That I felt comfortable on the boat and at sea, but yeah, less comfortable, I guess, going to people and interacting. But, so if but you, that has kind of, I think it's balanced. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, so. probably. I, I like both now. So if you go on that journey and, and, and starting out, so leaving first day, first nights, and then being on your own, if you say you like being on your own, but um, I mean, being on your own and having the option to meet someone if you want, compared to no option, how was that? Um, I have to say, I had more trouble with it in the beginning. Mm. So it, it really got better towards the end. In the beginning, I was really focused. I, looking forward to be back on land and yet not being alone whereas in the end i really actually enjoyed it and i, I somehow needed the, the peace and quiet on my own of course i had a long time to prepare myself and i knew i was going to be on my own so it wasn't like a big shock like oh, no, I'm what i'm gonna do yeah. it was yeah i don't know i didn't really i had actually i felt really comfortable and peaceful with it there were definitely moments that I missed my family and missed friends. Mm. Definitely, absolutely. There were also a lot of moments that I thought, why am I here? <laughs> why did I want to do this? But mostly I, I was able to remind myself that it was me who put me there and that it was my choice and my dream and I wanted to be there and I needed to bite through it and keep going. Uh, so that made the difficult moments easier, I think. Like just reminding myself like, okay, it's you who put you here. Don't whine about it. Just keep going, um, and yeah. In the end, I didn't so, I mean, have much trouble with it. I mean, when I now, I get now get the full idea why why EO invited you and Dirk, who organizes the event with Kai. Um, they're always very curious, and then he said, "Laura Deck has come." I like, that's a good idea because that's an experience because when you go on this entrepreneurial journey, sometimes you think like, "Why the hell did I do this?" Yeah. And then you ask yourself, and what you just said just hit me because, well, it's me who put myself <laughs> yeah, yeah. Into, Why am I into, this, well, that's pretty much my own fault. into this position. Yeah. So the difference is, when, as an entrepreneur, you have people around you and it takes some reflection to say, well, it's my fault. Everything we have here started because of me and works because of these other people. So that there's energy here. Right. When you're on your own and let's say you're frustrated about a day or something bad happened or it rains or whatever stuff you cannot change how, how did you feel through that like did you talk to yourself like like uh, i don't know what um, how, how can you imagine a day that is not going straightforward <laughs> happily well. sailing ever after um i i had my ways of dealing with it i um, 
often I would just pick up the guitar and play a song, like just to become relaxed again mm -hmm. and be able to think. Or I would write. I found writing really helps, like just writing out the situation, why I was angry, what I was angry at, like something breaking or something, yeah, something I couldn't really be angry at, but you're still angry because it happens and it's annoying. So I would, I would write it down and kind of read it over and go, you're really stupid. <laughs> just realizing what I had written that it was actually ridiculous the way I reacted. But I think if you write it down, you're able to look from an outside perspective mm. on yourself. And you think, okay, now I can see how I react and that actually maybe that's not the best way to react. Um, so that, that really helped. Um, uh, listening to music or just reading something. And that also helped me really to deal with fear or in difficult situations. If I just didn't know the answer straight away, distract myself, go do something else, write it down, make drawings of the problem. Um, and I, I definitely didn't stress myself to find a solution like right that moment mm -hmm. because something my dad had taught me much earlier in life is that often it's better to take your time to fix something or to do something well rather than stressing out and panicking or re overreacting to situations. So yeah, counting to 10, taking it easy, thinking over the problem and then fixing it. Even if something bad happens on the boat, I mean, uh, like yeah. even with our tiny sailing, I remember situations when certain ropes are But Where you feel like you have to act now. Yeah. Right. But if you panic and you feel like you have to do something now and you just do something because you feel like you have to do something, that could be the wrong thing to do. So in that situation, it would still be better to take that little moment to be able to make the right decision. And that's, yeah. That's something I really needed to realize. I couldn't, I couldn't panic or make decisions that later would be wrong if I think about it a little bit. How do you do that if, like you say, you have a moment of a complete breakdown and cry because I mean, everything feels wrong in that moment? Did you have that? It doesn't like when you describe yep. it now. It doesn't feel like it, but um, did did you have? Yeah, to? yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Mostly, I would just be really angry or whatever happened. I, I remember uh, because often it was also just that I realized it was stupid things for me that I didn't fix something well or look after it or check it or something. When, once um, a shackle broke from the main sheet and the sail just went out and the boom was like chafing against the rigging. So there was in the end, there was quite like a big, not quite a hole yet, but definitely a lot of damage done mm -hmm. on the boom. Which wasn't big damage, but I love the boat and I wanted it to be pretty. And so I was really angry at myself that I hadn't heard it or noticed it or anything. And yeah, and then I just kind of sat down and was angry at myself. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> it goes over. I like that. Uh, um, what what is it that you take with you before and after the journey? And I'm I'm of course know that you have been on the journey journey in a very special time when other people go through different journeys. But can you see something we say that was Laura before the journey, that was Laura after the journey? <laughs> A lot, I think. Uh, probably with states is just my stubbornness and determination and <laughs> that I want to do things uh, by way. Uh, but most of the other things changed. I, I got to see the world in a completely new way. I got to realize that it's really okay to be yourself and do your own things because everybody's different. You know, if you go to so many places and you see so many cultures and everybody is doing things their own way, then really the way you grew up and everybody saying you should be this and you should put those clothes on and this is the fashion and put your hair like that, it suddenly just really doesn't matter. I, I think it puts things really into perspective. Also being on the boat for so long without really having anything like a shower or a lot of water or a fridge. Uh, it made me really appreciate having just having basic things. Um, just having a nice Cuban mud drink or a warm shower or <laughs> like a dry bed or something. Um, and that's something that never left. I mean, it's nine, nine years ago that mm. I left and I still, still really appreciate that. So that's a big, Certainly a really big gift that I got from the journey. 
And I think most importantly to just keep, yeah, keep chasing your dreams and really, really doing things and not caring so much what other people think of it. I definitely learned that it's good to listen to the opinions of others if they're good opinions, mm -hmm. like if they know you. Um, but stay true to yourself and your own values. So, yeah, the way I do it is just when I have an idea, I write down my values and the way I want to do it and, and then listen to the input of others and see how that could possibly fit in. And that's something I did, I had before the journey, but definitely got much, much stronger through the journey. When you, what, what I hear and what I feel like when I met you, we met just like an hour ago or something, it, you can definitely feel you're in your place. Like you, like this is you and this is what you want to do. And, and when other people say like this is authentic, but there's a difference between playing a role and being that person. Right. And I find it fascinating that obviously your dad and your mom had some input on that, of mm -hmm. course. And it feels like you've been shaping that through the trip, like being on your own, listening yeah. to your own inner voice and being more and more clear on that. So if you, if you see yourself on that journey and then you said, and then you see the world in a different place, what is the contrast between you like seeing that and being so clear and then seeing the world in a different view? Huh, that's a good question. I'm not really sure how to answer that actually. Yeah, I, I feel like I've always, I've always been that and been mm. me. And yes, my parents did really help me put that me in that direction, but I don't really know me any other way. <laughs> if, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, I definitely had, you know, ups and downs and trying to, to really find myself and shape that. But I think I'm lucky to have found what I really want to do early in life and, and find my, my place. Although saying that, uh, I think uh, giving presentations and, and, and doing podcasts mm -hmm. and media and stuff was definitely something before the trip and also during the trip and even after the trip that I really, I hated it. Mm -hmm. Like I absolutely hated it. And that's something I have learned later on that I kind of accepted that I'm just stuck to it <laughs> and that actually I could do something good with it. And I think when that realization came that I need to look at a situation and see what I can do with that to make it something good. So there was definitely a time in my life where I was just kind of upset and, and felt like I wasn't at the right place. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's not what I wanted to do. And I didn't like the presentations and I didn't like the media and I wanted to go away from it. Um, until the realization came, okay, wait, but you know, it's there mm -hmm. and maybe I can do something good with it. And since then it's been much better just accepting it and actually turning it around to, to be a good thing. Uh, yeah, that, that, that probably doesn't mm -hmm. answer your question at all. It does. But it, it, I again, <laughs> very colorful image. So do you want to share what you do with it? Like, yeah, definitely. So it actually started out when I did it the first years, it was very self-reflecting and through the presentations I learned what I had learned <laughs> um, and then later on I started like, getting feedback from people saying wow that you know that was really inspiring and now I'm gonna follow my own dream and go sailing or do whatever and that's when I really started realizing okay maybe I can do something good with it so then I started changing my presentation around to be more like motivating and telling what I had learned and what my experiences were and what I think are really the important things in life and, uh, and sharing that. And I've really had a lot of people that I think have just like, it opened their eyes and I think, right, that's, that's true. They're stuck in this little bubble and because they hear these words and because I share their, my experiences with them, they are able to break outside that bubble. And that's, that's really, that's so beautiful to see. It's so amazing. And whether they go sailing or they do something completely else doesn't matter, but it's very cool. And then I worked in New Zealand with a school for a little while mm -hmm. and we were doing like outdoor stuff. So it started with sailing and then it went into camping and doing fishing trips and all sorts of stuff. And I realized that the, the age I did it was such a perfect age because that's really when, when the person is forming. I think this, 
these teenage years are, are super important in anybody's life. You can take any 10 year period in somebody's life. I think that period is what shapes them most and where they look back to. And that's when I realized really when I worked with these kids and I thought that's really the period where you should just put them into a situation where they get to know themselves. And sadly, they don't really get that experience or opportunity often. So that's what I'm focusing on more now, trying to build up a project and yeah, form them, get them the life skills and the insights that I got through my trip. What do you do with them? Well, um, it's still, I, I kind of started up the project last year, but what I want to do is build a big boat, like a 24 meter boat, and actually <laughs> go sailing around the world with them. So take groups of kids on the boat and go sailing, but they do need to do everything themselves. So they need to cook and clean and sail the boat and navigate. And there's just a team around to make mm -hmm. sure that everything is going to go fine because not every kid grew up sailing. Um, but I think, you know, schools are great. But there's a big part missing. And we talked about this earlier. You said, you know, entrepreneurship, it's really, you learn through, through doing, through experimenting. You, you try something and, and you fail and you try again and you fail again. And you, keep, you keep doing and you keep experimenting around until you find the thing. And schools are so theoretical, whereas mm. human beings really learn best through doing. But it's such a fine line because you can't try everything. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you just know you shouldn't do something because it turn, turns out really bad. So we need to do these things rather in theory. But to do only in theory, it doesn't work. We need to learn and practice also. So, yeah, I think we need to have theory and practice together as a school. And the, the practice part, I really want to pick up. But I do want to do the theory on the, on the boat as well. So just kind of like continue normal schooling and have the, the, the life skill and practice side as well. That's, that's a big, big thing. And now I can see what you mean <laughs> by you do something good and you realize how it can help other people. What I love about school though, compared to entrepreneurship is you have a community with people right away. That's very hard to have uh, as an entrepreneur when you just start out. There's so many people just on their own. Okay. Yeah, and I felt pretty alone in school. So maybe it's just no. different. <laughs> yeah. True, true, yeah. I can, uh, okay, I get that. Um, but if you would want it to the community, you're together with people. But, um, but of course, if you say you're more on the introvert side or you want to be yeah. on your own, I, I totally get that. But everywhere, to me, the difference in school is like everyone is starting on the same spot. Like you finish yeah, with everything. everyone together. And when you're an entrepreneur, like you have different you stages. You feel like you're alone in the world and you need to somehow make your thing reality, whereas nobody believes in it yet. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Like a, <laughs> most likely like a very stormy day when nothing works and uh, yeah. the, the bed is wet and yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I see that. But on the bars, we don't really have that because there is a there is a group yeah, of yeah. people that need to work together yeah how do you see when you said i see the world different today than before like you, you talked about cultures and all all that other stuff is there more where you say to me it's very hard to understand i don't know for example that people think in very national terms or like um i think the traveling definitely made me more understanding of all the different sorts of people and how they think and how they live and that that's the way they need to do it and that everybody's different and that in a way that's that's okay and that's good um but no mostly it it, it really I, I i realized I, yeah that it's okay to just be yourself whatever whatever that is if you think of i told you earlier that our youngest podcast listeners are like around eight to nine years old a bit before that age when you like do it, what, what would be something you would share with them what they should do in that age? Yeah, I think, I, I think a lot of kids actually know what they want to do, especially at that age. Um, and then there's a lot of adults that say, that's probably not a good idea and it's way too hard and you should do that. And maybe just, you know, go to normal path and get good notes in school. And then you will see when you grow up, you will see. And I think that's quite sad. If, if you're, if, at least for me, when I was like eight, nine, I had a lot of ideas and I wanted to do much, so much stuff. And I love that, that they were encouraging people. 
And it's really, really good to start doing things at that age mm. because there's so many opportunities and so many possibilities. And at the age of eight, nine, you have a mindset that you don't have anymore when you're 18. And it's hard to explain this to eight or nine years old because my dad did say that to me when I was like nine. And I was like, yeah, what are you talking about? Mm. But now I can say he was right. Um, so it's, it's great. Just start. You know, if you have a dream, it's better to start early. And life goes by fast, it's short. Uh, and if you start early, you achieve other things, you learn things earlier and you can get much further. Mm. But if you start when you're 18 or 19, which is still pretty early in this world, um, yeah, you've, you've missed a lot of years in which you could have actually achieved something. And it doesn't need to feel like work. I think when it's a, when it's a dream, when it's something you really want to do, it's it's a really fun way to go because I did. Now I feel like I, I did spend my whole childhood on <laughs> making this world trip happen. Um, and I offered up a lot of things for it. And I think for some kids that might be really difficult. You know, you have to offer up playing with friends or doing things that. You wanna, no, just keep talking. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you have to offer up things that. Maybe as a kid you don't really want to offer up. And I was very determined that that's what I wanted to do, so I did that. And looking back, that was definitely worth it. You know, I needed, I needed to do that, and I achieved something. And the time I could have spent playing, the practicing sailing, and the, in an, in, that was a just different way of playing and doing things. Thank you so much for taking the time before you have your speech, and um, it was a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.